Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. Joining us today at the round table of dim lighting is comedian, vlogger, and full-time co-host of the YouTube series SourceFed, Steve Zaragoza. Uh-huh. You know SourceFed, you've heard of SourceFed, most, one of the most popular current event shows on the internet, over a million and a half subscribers on their main channel. And Steve has been hosting it for three years and he's really helped shape what it has become. Oh yeah, um, you can also find Steve co-hosting SourceFed Nerd, another very popular channel within the SourceFed stable, as well as on the new SourceFed podcast, so check that out. He's a great host and we've always thought that Steve was a really funny guy. Yeah. Uh, he certainly is and you know, now we call him a friend too. So you know, when you have a an ear biscuit, we, we were friends but you know, it's like taking the relationship to another level oh. when when you add some like microphones and us having this this conversation and headphones and headphones too that um, really does it yeah we're a super funny guy but we did get to talk through the serious side of Steve a little bit um, so you'll hear that we talked about growing up in a sketchy neighborhood with drive by shootings and a halfway house next door his job is a video game tester which may not be what you think it is going to be. Uh, if you're if you're looking to get into that profession, uh, how he caught his first break and the interesting risk he took to capitalize on it, and what that first audition for SourceFed looked like. We also talked about uh, one of the more serious subjects that we've talked about on Ever in on your biscuit, biscuit. Yeah, uh, is the divorce that Steve is going through with his uh, his wife, separated now in the in in the midst of a divorce. Uh, what led up to that and how he's handled that, how that has changed him, uh, and how he's still in the midst of dealing with that. Uh, he calls it one of the most difficult things he's ever had to do. So Steve opened up, was very open in, in talking about that. So stick around for that. But first, guys, we just wanna remind you to download our new live album, Song Biscuits Volume One. I'm calling it live because, I mean, it was recorded live. There was no audience except for I mean the cameras that then we put it out there for you guys on the Good Mr. Morning in, channel. In one sense, though, Link, that makes everything live, right? I mean, yeah, everything was live at some point. Okay, every song, but we I shouldn't mean, call it a live album because that implies things that it's not. But you should download it anyway on iTunes. Song right. Biscuits Volume One. Yeah, all these songs recorded in about an hour using uh, your suggestions that you gave us on the internet, usually collaborating with somebody. Here's an example of one of those, the Five Nights at Freddy's song featuring Markiplier. Five Nights at Freddy's, getting 120 a week, and they're not even responsible for dismemberment or injury. I only need one night to know that I don't want night to, or have my body mangled, crushed, and stuffed inside a Freddy Fazbear suit. If Markiplier wasn't there, we, w we wouldn't have known Anything, too, too much about nothing. that. So he was like an, a collaborator and, and, and an expert, um, what's it called? Uh, consultant. consultant. Yeah, consultant. Yes. 15 original songs, all based on your tweets, masterfully crafted and available to put into your ears holes. <laughs> your ears holes. There's two ears and they, they are, each have yeah, a hole. Right. Uh, so uh, get that on iTunes, also available on Amazon. Thanks for getting those, thanks for rating and reviewing the album on iTunes. Yes, and now on to The Biscuit. Do you remember the first time we met, Steve? Do you Cause, remember? Because you met us at the same time. So was it was it the, um, the uh, uh, what was that show? Was it the thing at the Paramount lot? Was yes. it the first time I met you guys? Yeah, that was it. Uh, what was, what was that show? Love. Burning Love, yeah. The Burning that, Love that season was the two first premiere. Time. We were standing in line for like ice cream, right? It, it was, was a food cart. It was That's a food right. cart. It was an ice cream food cart. It was like ice cream sandwiches or something. After the yeah, screening, something we all came out and um, or was it tacos? It could have been tacos. They were too. both. I think we had both, man. Yeah, we did have we both. Had, you know, it was a time. dinner and dessert. <laughs> but we were in line, and and you got in line. But yeah. I remember the, the biggest thing I remember about that night, besides meeting you, yeah. is <laughs> the fact that we showed up and we were overdressed. Like, Rhett and I had on ties and- Oh yeah, like, you guys looked great. But you also were dressed sim I, I, similarly. I did it, I did nice up a little bit. Yeah. Because I didn't know. But it was one, yeah. Of, yeah, I didn't know either. And they called it a premiere. Yeah. And everyone else just like came from work or whatever they were right. doing that day. Super cash. 
casual. And so here we are in ties. But what's worse? What's worse, really? Being overdressed or underdressed? I guess it depends on what kind of person you are. Because I like Break to- Break it down. Well, for me, I'm a wacky guy. So if I'm overdressed, I'm loving it. Oh, hey, side note. <laughs> I'm just going with it. Side note, only a wacky guy can refer to himself as a wacky guy. I think that is the definition of being a wacky guy. It's being able to yeah. use the word wacky yeah. sincerely. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Well, and you're right. Th- I didn't crack The funny a thing is, is I, I had no idea what conclusion you were going to come to until you said it. Because you're like, I'm a wacky guy. So that means I like to be underdressed. I, like, I didn't. <laughs> I had no idea where you could. It could have gone anywhere. Yeah, either way. <laughs> no, I, I would have thought that wacky people like to underdress because look, oh he yeah, he shouldn't be here because he's underdressed, but he's wacky. So. Is that guy from the streets? He, no, you he's know? just wacky. Right. But, but I feel like couldn't you say the exact same thing about an overdressed person and be like, could. that guy's gotta be wacky. Something's wrong with that guy. Yeah. Either yeah. something's oh, wrong right. yeah, or yeah. like that. Is that what wacky means? Something's well, wrong with you? Wacky could be <laughs> <laughs> wacky could be either this man is so silly he doesn't know any better yeah, yeah. or like craze right craze like a man who dresses up in a three piece suit to like mumble to himself on a park yes, bench yes which is a thing it's totally a you thing you know it's yeah. like why does that guy dress well like so he could talk to himself <laughs> but I would have but I think someone who's overdressed is you know the risk is Oh, that stiff's trying too hard. Mm. Well, yeah. And He's then, got something to prove. Those two guys who showed up together, make internet videos that aren't as good as this series, are yep. trying to prove themselves by right, right, wearing right. a tie. They want to stand out. Yeah, yeah. Wanna, yeah, trying to compensate for something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you guys feel super awkward after that? Like, did you realize right away that you were overdressed? Yes. I, there, I mean, there's a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of built in insecurity when anybody from our world kind of goes into, even though that was like a on a, a, lot. a Netflix show. But it was on a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and it was yeah. movie stars, it was movie Yeah, people. you're like, oh yeah, we're the guys from YouTube that nobody knows and yeah. we're a duo and we're both dressed in ties. <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, should we get tacos or should we just leave? But I think that we, you know, we, we recognize your face, we knew you from SourceFed, yeah. and you know we go way back with Joe, and you know, and yeah. so that's but that's when we met. You know, we yeah. started talking, and we over some food truck ice cream. Yeah, it was great. But you were also overdressed, so it was like I was. That was the tipping point. That was yeah. like, what am I going to speak to Steve? Or is this going to be the first meeting? He's overdressed. Yeah. Absolutely, he, this is the moment. We right. were all in the same place. We were thinking sure. exactly the same thing. We were. Yeah. Do you think that there's some sort of uh, chip on our shoulders, and I'm talking about all three of us oh. here. You know, when you enter like a some more of a traditional entertainment environment, I mean, is there something to that that's like, I don't feel like we had anything to prove, but maybe we did. I mean, I wanted to be underdressed versus overdressed. Do you, do you feel like there's something there like when you say, when people ask you what you do, and it's like, well, you know, I'm on a YouTube show and um, you know, how does it feel? I don't know. I felt like I feel like for me back then, it like I was I was still kind of just getting into the source fed thing. So it was kind of like because this was like two or three years ago, right? Yeah, two and a half years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah, at, le- at least two. Cause, yeah, yeah, because we were with Stevie, and it was like the first thing we had gone to with Stevie. And, but so, in yeah, ge- the beginning I'm, of the, that year, yeah, I'm just saying in general, though, there is a sense of when even you're now, having, even now, even okay. now, when you're having conversations with someone who like has a point of reference for entertainment or is in traditional entertainment, there's this like, I mean, we're still looked at yeah. as kind of a separate thing, well, right? How, what do you say when somebody asks you what you do? Oh man, it changes. Because sometimes I'll just say like, just to keep it simple and to not have to like explain and explain and explain. Sometimes I'll just be like, I'm an actor. Hmm. Like I'll just straight up say I'm an actor. Right. And then when they go like, oh, what do you do? Or like, what have I, have I seen you in anything? Then it's like, okay, well, I do YouTube stuff. Like I do mostly YouTube stuff. Okay, so that's not really acting, is it? Well, I mean, it so kinda... you're still there again. You tried to get out of I it. I tried, and but then they it, still yeah. suck you into right. the long explanation. And now you seem like a liar too. <laughs> right. But sometimes it's easier to lie than to like explain what it, it is. is. What it is we do. Yeah. Like I went into. We went to a sushi restaurant with our families last night, but Rhett wasn't coming in yet. And it was a family right there at the first table. And the kid who was probably 10 years old, like he, he recognized me, he was like, Link? And I was like, hey man. And his dad looked at me like, you know this who are, man? Who are you <laughs> speaking to an adult man. How do you know this man? Coming into the sushi restaurant. I met him at the park, dad. So he was he, on a bench by himself <laughs> mumbling. So the dad. In a three piece suit. <laughs> the dad looks Clearly at me. Clearly overdressed. And I say to the dad, uh, 
Yes, uh, I'm a food critic, and I'm here to review the restaurant. I have a I have a popular internet presence as a, and I still backed into internet presence. But I want <laughs> I was kind of messing with him to see if his son what his son would do. Was his son laughing he, at least? His son was totally confused. Oh no! So, so it didn't it work. went over his head. Yeah, yeah it didn't not, work. Is he a really so, a food critic? So then what was, is a food critic? <laughs> maybe you made him think. <laughs> oh man, maybe I got the wrong guy. Yeah, or maybe this guy does. <laughs> maybe he is a food critic. <laughs> But there's a, I mean, it's getting better. I mean, people understand YouTubers a lot more, but. Well, the thing that always that, that always happens, I feel like it's, because saying I'm a YouTuber could mean, you know what, I do this other thing and I also do, do YouTube or it could mean like, no, I've done this for a long time and it's, we make a living and we run a company and, but you don't want to say those things. You sound like a jerk when you try to justify it. Right. So, it's like it's like wearing a, a tie so, so, to yeah, a, so somebody's a, like, a digital premiere. <laughs> oh, you're a YouTuber. Uh, so you is that going well? And I'm like, yeah, it's going pretty well. <laughs> right. it, it's it, but you don't want to be like, yeah. Let me tell you how many people have watched my stuff. Well, and then you pull out your your analytics. Like you've got <laughs> yeah, a look. printout of your analytics. <laughs> right. Check it, this out. It, it just puts you in a difficult situation. It but does. I, I, I think that. Uh, yeah, so go, going back to the, the genesis of this whole thing, yeah, I, I, I'm gladly admit I've got a chip on my shoulder. Yeah. But that's part of, I mean, that's that's why we keep pushing, right? It is, you kind of have to, right? Yeah. Especially in this kind of business, in the, whole, in the whole YouTube thing. Right. I think so, I'm trying. I mean, we're not releasing an album. Actually, we did just release an album. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, so are, you said you were gonna do I'm that. I'm working on like an you, album, You yeah. asked us about our album. Yeah. But well, tell us about that. You're well, doing an album. I am. I'm you making promised an album. the internet in like November of 2014. Yeah, yeah. I made it. I made a very uh, interesting promise that I would release an album, and there's no reason for me not to. But or what for was not it? To did you, to. Was that an impromptu promise or <laughs> no, <laughs> no? No. So it's I. I don't know. I've been doing music stuff for a while, and on the on the SourceFed show, I've done like some songs and stuff. Like you guys talked about the bear. The, song, bear, the bear song. Yeah, we were we were rewatching the bear <laughs> yeah. song, which was just. Totally off the cuff. Yeah, so it was an improv. He's a bear, and he's gonna grow up and be a mother bear. Baby bear. He's going into a big he's bear. Grow up and be a bear. Yeah, he's a baby bear, but he's gonna grow up to be a bear. He's a baby, baby bear, but he's gonna grow up. He's gonna get hair down in his crotch area. He's gonna be a bear. Absolutely ridiculous. He's so and amazing. Ridiculous. And there's just something about Patricia being there and <laughs> yeah, like yeah. clapping and smiling in all the right places. Oh, that that's why I love something. Trisha. Yeah, Trisha like was down for everything. She's right. totally down. Like you started to go into the weirdest place possible. Some people would be like, that's weird and kind of shut it down. That's wacky. But yeah, that's too wacky. <laughs> but Trisha would be like, yeah, I'm going to clap along and smile and go right along with it. Right. Which I don't think it would have worked as well if it was somebody else. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I uh, b- have been doing music for a while on SourceFed. And so whenever I meet people or like I get tweets often that are like, when are you going to do an album? When are you going to do an album? When are you going to release real songs? When's the bear song going to be on iTunes? Stuff like that. Yeah. And Lee and I actually used to sing a lot too together. Mm-hmm. And then people would be like, when are you and Lee going to make an album? And where's this? And so I've always talked about doing it and I've always wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And now I just feel like, why not? It's it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of easy to make an album now. Oh, yeah. You right. can make one at home. You don't need yeah. like a studio to do it. So, so I mean, so, where are you at in the process? Because you, you made the promise in, you know, I did make the promise. Six months ago. I did. I'm actually, um, believe it or not, I'm five songs deep. Oh, yeah. I don't have complete lyrics. Is that the name of the album? I don't know yet. <laughs> that's I don't know. That's I don't called have... an EP, by the way. It's five right songs now, it's deep. an EP. I'm five songs deep, and that's the that's the name of the album. Five songs deep. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Is the bear song one of them? I don't know. If, I don't know yet because I don't know if I own the bear song. What do you mean? Because it might be a oh. source fed thing. Oh, you got to oh. figure that yeah, out. Yeah, so I need to mm. figure that out. You know a yeah. good way to figure it out? How do you do that? Put it on Just your album. Just put it on the album and see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just spin the wheel. Just see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? I'm still on SourceFed. Just call it right, the B-A-R yeah. song. <laughs> Change the words a little bit. I, and I meant to say E too because that would be the bar song. Yeah, the B-A-R-E song. The B-A-R-E. Right. The bear song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. What I, You're burying yeah. like yourself. The naked. I like that. It's definitely, so what I so do So what know, are the five? Can you th- tell us? This is what I know about the album. <laughs> this is what I can tell you. It's an an, It's definitely about animals. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you're joking. No, it's oh, about animals. But not a bear. See, that's the thing. Everyone, because it's an animals thing. And the reason why, 
let me tell you, let me back up a little bit. Please. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go back to the genesis of this a little bit. So people have been asking for it. And so I started really thinking about it, about making an album. And I've, I've done like songs in the past and I've got like some weird stuff that like, in fact, I started a band out of high school called Christmas Surprise with a friend of mine. And it's just this really strange, I played this foreign guy. Was it a my, seasonal band? It, no, it, it wasn't. It was year round. It was a year round Christmas exactly. surprise. Exactly. It was wacky because it was Christmas it's around. That made it wacky. Exactly. Imagine a Christmas surprise in July. It's a real surprise. It doesn't get any more surprising True. than that. So it was, it was very like um, folk music-y and we did a lot of like, I did a dinosaur song uh, and so I have this song called Dinosaur Land that I'm very proud of that just kind of it's on my SoundCloud and that's it. Baby, just take my hand. Watch yourself. The forest is dangerous. Baby, the creatures are ravenous. In this land that's far from home It is a land where creatures roam How many people on earth ever have said, I've got this song, Dinosaur Land, that I'm really proud of. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the great thing about you, Steve. Again, it's like that moment of like, you're so funny all the time. Yeah. And even the things when you're just like being straight with me, I'm being I just, straight, it's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> so you've got this Dinosaur Land song that you're really proud of. I'm very proud of this dinosaur song <laughs> that I wrote with a friend of mine named Isaiah. And uh, so the, it's just sitting there. And then, like, you know, years and years and years and years later, when I started doing Source Fed, um, a, a good friend of mine who's actually a producer at Source Fed now, Darren Gerdner, yeah. he, and you guys know Darren, mm-hmm. Darren's a good guy. He came to me after a trip from New York and said, I went to this museum in New York and I saw this massive whale, this like whale statue or something. And he's like, I thought of a funny vine where like someone where like you ask someone, excuse me, where are the whales? And you just yell out whales to someone's face. And, and he's like, it's just as fun. And I thought it was funny. But yeah. I was like, why don't we make it into a song? And so we started writing this whales song. And so now we have this whales song. <laughs> and then I've also got this dinosaur song. And everybody – and a lot of people really like the whales song. So then I was thinking – and then they started saying like, well, make an album, make an album. And yeah. so I was like, okay, I've got this dinosaur song. I've got this whale song. I've got a bear song. Yeah, I mean just complete the – you Why know, not? The circle of life. I'm kind of there. I'm already there. So it's going to be a it's build out be, the ecosystem. Build it out. Build out that world. Bring in that universe in there. And so I've uh, so yeah, it's an it's going to be a, an album about animals. And right now I've got a song called so got whales, which is like the, I think the 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 single. And then right. I've got um, <laughs> I've got uh, the Dinosaur Land song, and then uh, I'm working on a song. I've never talked. I haven't talked about this. This is exclusive for oh, you yeah. guys. Excellent. You know, three people are very excited about hearing this right now. I'm feeling their excitement. There, you, <laughs> so am I. It's buzzing on my phone. Uh, there's a song about the axolotl. You guys know what the axolotl is? No, that's it's, a body part. <laughs> no, it's not a body part. I had mine taken out last you year. Did, <laughs> you did, and you don't need it. Yeah, it's an right, evolutionary yeah. blunder. <laughs> no, the uh, the axolotl is a, um, some people say is like the real life Pokemon character. It's like this oh. cute little sea creature that looks, you've seen it. It's got like a big smile on its face and it looks like okay. adorable. Anyway, they're going extinct and they're, and I believe they don't exist in the wild anymore. Oh, wow. So now they're just in captivity, but they're adorable creatures. And so I have a song called the axolotl lullaby, which is, which is. Sounds sad. Kind of, it is a and sad song. And you mean song. like you're putting it to sleep to like die? You know. Like I, to go extinct? You know, I think it's one of those things where it'll be open to interpretation, but it's definitely a lullaby like go to sleep. But in my mind, I think it is like an extinction song. It's almost like, goodbye, <laughs> goodbye, sleeps. Are they all kind of improv based or you go more in like a meticulous joke direction? Like, what do you know, what do we have to expect here? I think it, the, well, the whale song, it's all absurd stuff. Yeah. It's like very, I don't, I don't know. I, I'd, like, I'd like it to be slightly m- less uh, just kind of like uh, impromptu improv comedy, more like slightly well thought out. But I don't know if that works for this type of music. I feel Hmm. like it needs to feel still impromptu because people love the bear song a lot and then they like the whale song. 
And so it should be very... pretty like a pretty live performance. Yeah, that. I feel like it. I feel like people would like that. Yeah, I would like it. And I want to do it for you. Yeah. Do it for me. I'll commit to listening. Will you? We commit to listening to Perfect. it. We'll least... buy a copy and we'll share it. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go, that's what I'll commit I'll to. I'll go at least five songs deep into your That's album. great. And the, those five songs are going to be the best because that's where most to, most of the time will be put. Yeah, the first five and are going to be great. the first five are going to be great. After that, it's bad. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's find out uh, how Steve Zaragoza became the Steve we see before us ooh, right now. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Oxnard. Oh, really? Yeah. That's a street. <laughs> it is. It's like, a street. It is a street. And it takes and you all the way to Oxnard. And it takes you, you to Oxnard. You you it's almost like like uh, <laughs> so, Oz. Yeah, Oxnard like is the street that goes down the valley. Yeah, it's, it's one, well one of them. Yeah, yeah. No, there is this big main Oxnard street that goes through the valley, but there's also a city called Oxnard. That's like where the there's some boats there. There right? are boats. That's yeah, that's where you get in the ocean that's on your get, sailboat. Yeah, Port Wainimi is, yeah. a, is a little port. In Oxnard, where you can park your boats. There's also like the CBs, which are these military guys that have like a little base there, a little base set up. So that's where you were born and raised. I was born and raised in Oxnard. What and was t- the situation? Like both parents, siblings? Yeah, I got a two. I got a mom and dad and an older brother named Frank. And he's a good guy. He and I are pretty close. He has a child now. You're an uncle. I'm an uncle. It's weird. Is he in the Nard still? He's in Camarillo now. Oh, that's cool. Oh. The Camarillo. Supposedly the best climate on earth. I don't I don't disagree. That's what I've been told. It's possible. That and like Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara's a nice yeah. nice town. That's gotta so, be good weather there. So what what was the vibe like there? What did your parents do? What was your upbringing like? Oxnard's a very dangerous town. Uh especially when I was a kid. A lot of gang activity, a lot oh, of really? danger. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of shootings and gangs doing terrible things. Like at one point in my neighborhood, there was like a drive by shooting at the end of my block. My dad's car got like bullet holes in the glass. Oh, and the, not, not the sticker kind that you get it like. Not the, the fun small. sticker kind. <laughs> not the <Actual>. novelty sti- <laughs> bullet holes. <laughs> Actual real like potential death bullet holes. Wow. So, so were you on the on the fringe of something dangerous or was your neighborhood very much dangerous? I think my neighborhood wasn't as dangerous as some other parts of Oxnard, but it was very much like a ghetto in a way. Like next door, uh, right n- the entire time I grew up next door, there was a halfway house and it was full of like rehabilitated adults. So it could be like recovering drug addicts and also like potential like criminals, like hard criminals that are being rehabilitated and brought back into society. And, these, and like, what's your houses. interface with these people? Well, they live right next door. So we would, they would talk to us over the fence sometimes as children, which is kind of That's terrifying. Healthy. It's, healthy. it's just talk. Hey, it's just talking. <laughs> there was never any like physical interaction. There was a lot of weird activity there. A lot. Of, in fact, more than once the police needed to enter our home to get into our backyard to, to stop an altercation in the house next door in the halfway house. Did you know that this was kind of a big deal for a kid? No, I didn't. Because it was just I think your normal. It, it just seems so normal to me because I grew up with it, you know? Like, and also something that like my friends still talk about to this day is that we had bars on our windows. Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, like the, the kind of like paranoid, like we don't want anyone in our home type yeah. bars. But it wasn't like a paranoid reason it was because it's literally a dangerous neighborhood that people like break into homes type, yeah. type deal so that was like my that's your parents my, just didn't put them in your bedroom window no, so you couldn't escape no, no but it's they like probably should have the house they're, they're just in my bedroom just, which is weird they must have wanted me to be protected they didn't want me to get hurt no they, it was on all the bars and what, the what, what'd your uh your parents do my dad worked in like machine like he built hard drive parts so he worked in this like factory where they built like uh, the tiny pieces that used to go into old school hard drives. And my mom was a teacher. She used oh. to teach like preschool and uh, kindergarten and stuff like that. And did they teach you to be so comedic? How did that you, start I, to bud? You know, I don't know because neither of my parents are intentionally funny. They're like kind of like <laughs> Thanks accidentally. Thanks for the, the clarification. <laughs> yeah. Intentionally. It's one of those things where like, and you know what I'm talking oh, about, yeah. where like, because my dad is, um, my dad grew up in Mexico until he was like 18 and then he moved to the US. Okay. So he's got this very much like uh, foreign kind of like mentality. So he's got this kind of like strange outlook on life and, and how to be a person and a man and kind of like all the machismo stuff, which is the exact opposite of what I am because I'm 
the most like I'm the girliest not Mexican dude ever. And my <laughs> both my parents are are Mexican. I'm a Mexican guy. So what what do you think contributed to you saying, okay, well I'm the I'm I'm the complete opposite in a lot yeah. of ways. Like, you know, how did that come about? I think I was just a super weird kid and I would do very weird things and I was always like my dad had this Betamax camera. And then Betamax is like the stuff before VHS. Mm-hmm. And uh I, my brother and I would borrow it and film all these sketches. And why do did why it. did he have it? And what did he use it for? I guess he was using. It. <laughs> you're yeah. kind of like you're shining the light. What was he doing on July fourteenth, nineteen eighty three? Max. Yeah. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> no, I think he was um, interested in filming, like doing family kind of like home videos. Yeah, home videos, like like videos of my brother and I growing mm-hmm. up, going to the beach and like hanging, going camping with the family and stuff like that. Right. Okay. You know, normal dad video. Type type stuff sure sure. so we would take the camera and my brother and i would make these sketches and we'd have like puppets we'd have like sesame street puppets and kermit and stuff and we'd do like the muppet show type sketches and stuff like that so we were always my brother and i were both very wacky dudes <laughs> we were both <laughs> there's that word again and uh so and i think i it started to realize that it was a little bit weirder than like my brother at mm. times and then very much different and weirder and had a different sense of humor than my mom and dad or like my cousins or even some of my friends. So I started to realize like, I guess I'm kind of a wacky guy and I make people laugh. So I guess this is like kind of my thing. And my mom was like super supportive of it too. Like she would watch me like draw weird things. Like I would draw comic book type things and I would mm-hmm. like do sketches and put on little like talent shows in the house and my mom was like super supportive of it. So I feel like it was you, a combination. You had an entertain, you, you were very much an entertainer. Yeah, from the very start. Yeah, so like, I mean, there's lots of people who are successful on YouTube that they'll, they will have grabbed their parents' camera and, but it's more of like, oh, I want to be a filmmaker. Right. Versus this is just one of many mediums. It could be, it could be, it could be charcoal. It could be a Betamax camera. I'm an entertainer, and it's just got to happen. That sounds like yeah. your story. Yeah, it wasn't. It, I had zero interest in the filmmaking aspect of it. I had more interest in being in front of the camera and like making people laugh and doing mm-hmm. wacky things, like, like the ha- talent show in grade school. You yeah. were you were up there doing just, your just talent, just being a being a, a a wacko. Did it? Did this? Did you stand out not only from your family, but? In terms of your community, because you said, okay, yeah. your mom and dad are both Mexican, so are you yeah. in a Mexican community yeah. for, for the most part? Yeah, primarily. Primarily a Hispanic area of town. Yeah, so, and also growing up, too, you kind of had the pressures of like, oh, man, are you going to be like a homie? Are you going to be like, you're going to join a gang? Or are you going to do that kind of thing? Like, the climate was very strange so how, for how, the how does that, is that like the quintessential, like, hey, kid, you, you know, like, <laughs> how does that happen? I don't know. I feel like it's one of those things where, like, depending on what school you go to, it's kind of like what kind of click you're going to blend into and then who you're going to associate with and who your friends are going to be. And I feel like for me, it could have ended up really badly where I wouldn't be able to associate with anybody. But luckily, I was able to kind of like find other jokesters and kind of like entertainers and class clown type people mm-hmm. and associate with them and steer clear of the kind of more dangerous lifestyle. Like as a kid, I did nothing dangerous. I never like started garage fires or – you know, got arrested or tried to steal candy or like rode my bike and like in the middle of the street or anything like that. I was this super like. Or did you experience any, any sort of uh, criticism because you because you made those choices because you didn't want yeah. to hang out? Yeah, I was with- I was definitely pushed around a lot and bullied for not being like like how come you don't want to play soccer, man? Or how come you don't want to play football? Or you know, why don't you want to be all sportsy? And my brother would even be like, let's play basketball, and I'd be like, I kind of want to just play Battle Toads <laughs> or like Bubble Bobble or something. As long as it starts with a B, does that count? And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bionic Commando. <laughs> like that game. So how did you start to f- find your breakthrough? It's like, you know, what was it a high school play? Was it a... You know, where was your, where was that outlet for you that, oh, this, this is really starting to take off? I think it was kind of like, I would always gravitate towards the, the entertainment stuff. So even as early as like third and fourth grade, I would do like little talent showcase type things. Or like whenever there was a talent show, I would get my friends together and we'd get a song and we'd like, you know, lip sync to a song or something like that. So I knew, I guess I always knew that I wanted to entertain in some aspect as like a younger kid, but definitely as I got into high school, I would try to do plays and musicals and things like that. Like I did Our Town. I did like 
uh, Bye Bye Birdie and like little bit things uh-huh. here and there. But my big break, quote unquote, was when I was Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors oh. in high school. And that was like a dream come true. It was <laughs> like- Is that a plant? Oh, yeah. Well, no, Seymour is the that's main the guy. the lead. The main guy. The that's lead. That's Rick Moranis. Yeah, that's the Rick Moranis. Oh. That is the dude. He's like the lead role in that. So I was like super stoked. I was like, this is me. This is the role I was born to play. My mom would like- you will let me watch Little Shop of Horrors as a very young kid, which maybe she shouldn't have done. But like you know, it's not that bad of a movie. But hey, it, it helped you, right? It totally helped me. It, it definitely like I loved the creatures and kind of like the comedy and like you know I loved it even before I even understood a lot of the jokes and a lot of the mm-hmm. the stuff going on in the movie. But so anyway, did you kill it? I killed it in the auditions first of all, <laughs> and then I killed it in the rehearsals. And then we got to like this halfway point where we were like halfway through rehearsals, you know, everyone's all selected. We got our understudies, everything's ready to go. But my drama teacher came to me and said, listen, um, your grades suck. <laughs> like your grades are real bad. Like, and if you don't pick them up and if you don't like maintain at least this amount, of, which was like something ridiculous. Like if you don't at least get a D plus in like your classes, we can't let you do this. And so I was like, oh, crap, uh, hmm. I don't know what to do. And so it it, it was weird because as Study. a- Study. Right? But I mean, like, I, it's it seems weird to think about it now as an adult, but like, and you hear people say it too, like, I was too cool for school or something, but I just feel like I wasn't meant to be in school. Like, school just never worked for me. It mm-hmm. just was never a place where I felt welcome or comfortable or, you know- uh, math class and English class and things like that. Like I just couldn't focus. Mm. I wanted to like make the class laugh or like draw pictures or do something creative. Mm-hmm. So what did you do? I just did that. I made the class laugh and I, but and I mean, I drew with pictures. your ultimatum, I mean, I, I honestly lost it. I lost the role and I was kicked oh, out of the play. Wow. Yeah. And it was this huge, like turning point in my life where I was like, Oh man, like I really screwed this up. A lot of people were counting on me. A lot of people wanted me to do this. And I just kind of like let it go because I wasn't going to like put the initiative in to like really like land this. But you didn't let it slow you down. I didn't let it slow me down, but it really, it, it I kind of spiraled into this like, I don't care kind of like teen angsty type place hmm. where I was just like, you know, screw this and screw that. And like school wasn't for me. So I stopped going and I would just go to like my video production class and I would go to my drama class. And that was it. And then I would skip out of everything else. And I wasn't doing, I wasn't like going to the mall or like going, you know, behind the bushes to smoke pot or like hang out with my bad kid friends or whatever. I just would like become this super anxiety ridden, depressed, antisocial kind of hermit person because I went into this weird failure territory of like, I sucked at school. I couldn't do this thing. I couldn't do that. I was bad at this. And I'm a weirdo that doesn't feel like I belong. So, like, I just went into this weird, like, hermit crab zone. And I know you, you've you've been really open about your your past struggles with weight. Yes. Uh, and was that beginning to be a struggle at, oh, yeah. in high school? Yeah. I mean, I was always just the kind of, like, cuddly, fat kid that was, like, a nerd, but he was funny. And, like, you know, I was in the friend zone, if you want to call it that or whatever. And I would just be very much in this kind of like class clowny place but definitely not in this kind of like comfortable like I feel good about being a teenager place and so I didn't really get to like enjoy being a teenager because I had all these insecurities and I had all this anxiety which I didn't know at the time was anxiety Hmm. or depression or whatever it was and then to top it all off all I wanted to do was like entertain and make people laugh and make music and sketches and do comedy and I didn't realize at the time that like if I wanted to do that what I needed to do was work my ass off and Mm. like really get in there and study and do all that. Like everybody else did, even the comedians that I idolized. And I guess I just didn't see that at the time. So it sounds like you were kind of on that. That was kind of a, you were on a downward trend. Like how far down did it go before you found a way back up? I think it, I think honestly it was that I met, the girl that would eventually become my wife that is now not my wife, that is now my ex-wife. But I mean, I met this girl who like changed my life. In high school? In high school, yeah. And so it was one of those things where she was like, 
and she was like an, a straight A student. Hmm. Like she, her grade point average was like insane. Her parents were like, "Wait a minute, you're going to be dating this guy who's like a total loser." And like it was one of those situations. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like and she. We, and we met her at the same time we met you. Yeah, you did. Yeah. What's her name? Amy. Sarah. Sarah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Sarah, like basically pulled me out of this funk of like i i'm a loser and I'm, I'm a failure and she kind of like taught me about how you know i can succeed if i just work and i can do whatever i want to do and i should like get out there and get a job and get my license and so she really kind of like whipped me into shape so if it wasn't for her i don't know where the hell i'd be i'd probably hmm. be this like weird 30 year old man living at home still and were you dating or was that friend zone <laughs> i wasn't dating well sarah and i were very good friends for like a year and then we ended up dating and then my life like completely turned around and that was when like everything went on the up and up okay so this is like right after high school or? this was like just before i dropped out of high school so it was like junior year senior year of high school it, but you did drop out of high dropped school dropped out yep and then what so what i did was i did a bunch of stupid retail jobs like i worked at like a uh, hot topic in the mall which is like the dumb it was a terrible job a lot of I, black t-shirts a lot of black t-shirts a lot of spongebob and black t-shirts which mm -hmm. was a weird combination that didn't yeah. make sense to it's me like two sections to that place <laughs> yeah exactly it's like you're in the front you're like hey i'm bringing my kids in and then all of a sudden i said well don't keep going back here kids yeah Get this is weird. the i hate my dad section and this is the i love spongebob and yeah. my little pony section <laughs> like it's very strange it's a bipolar <laughs> store but i worked at a bunch of retail jobs and then i worked at like a video game store um and then i got married in 2006 and at the time i had had this really terrible job i was doing like quality assurance qa testing at a video game company called thq and THQ made like some of the worst games, like really difficult video games. And you but were it, playing them to see if was, they work? Yeah, it was the worst. I mean, these jobs exist for a reason, and I'm glad they do because they make video games even better. Uh, but a lot of these kids, these like out of high school, sometimes still in high school, college student kids are just like sitting like brainless zombies in front of a computer monitor playing these games over and over again. And you have to play them incorrectly. You can't even really play them because it sounds like a cool job. Like, oh, man, I get to play video games all day. But what they don't tell you is, is you're playing them wrong all day. So like you're racing your car backwards on the track and you're like <laughs> jumping down this same hole 900 to times. To see if like that accidentally beats the game. Right, or if something. it accidentally beats the game or if it makes like Mario's head pop off and right, like right, it stays right. there. Zone. That's how the warp zone <laughs> yeah, came about. Yeah, exactly. But it wasn't Mario or it was bad games It was too. really bad. It was like some kind of rocket power. Like you guys remember the show Rocket Power? This mm -hmm. might have been beyond our, our time. Like it was, uh, we were older when that show was okay. coming out. But, and yeah, then was, you would, something would go wrong and you'd have to take notes. Yeah, and you'd have to, I mean, and you had to, like, make the most thorough, ridiculous notes. It would just be like, you couldn't just say, guy falls and his leg stays in place in this world. You had to be like, at this specific point in the game, these are the enemies nearby. It was like the most torturous gross job ever talk about sucking the fun out of oh, something that's supposed to be exactly. fun yeah, 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 yeah. exactly wow. it makes you hate video you're games. the sacrificial lamb of video games <laughs> yeah, it's like, so you can enjoy it <laughs> right exactly so and, you come home to sarah like yeah. I mean, you're like newlyweds you're coming yes. you're coming home from this terrible job. job hating everything and just thinking like what am I going to do? Like, this is going to be my life now. Like, You're I want to entertain. At the time. No, this time we, at this point, we had moved to Oak Park, which is kind of like in Thousand Oaks ish yeah, okay. type area. And this was like in 2006. And so I would come home and be like, I hate my job. I want to entertain. And at the same time, I'm with my friends making sketches and not necessarily doing stuff on YouTube yet, but. Knowing about YouTube and having that be kind of like an inspiration for a lot of the sketchery. And, and stuff you're slowly that getting closer to Los Angeles. Slowly getting closer to Los Angeles, little by little. <laughs> and so one day there was this contest at Sony Pictures to be their like official vlogger or uh, blogger for Comic-Con. Okay. They, they had like Comic-Con coming up and they were like, we want someone to be our official Sony Pictures blogger. And so the contest was to make a video explaining why you would want to do that and why you would be good for that. Make a video why you would want to type about stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was so strange. Yeah, be a blogger and just write things, but make a video explaining why you'd be good at it. So weird. But my buddy Owen and I, we put our heads together and we, I made this little video and it's still up on the internet. And it's just like why I should be their, their spokesperson. And I did this stupid joke that was like, 
at the time, Brooke Burke was like this huge E! Mm -hmm. news person, like, and she would go around and do her wild on show on E! And so I said, I'm not Brooke Burke, but I can be. And I slapped this name tag on my shirt that says Brooke Burke on it. And it was just like, whatever. It was just stupid. And the next thing I know, Sony calls me and they're like, you won. We want you to come to Comic-Con. All expenses paid. We'll get you a hotel and everything and we want you to write for us. And I was like, this is great. This is the big break. This was the thing I was waiting for. So I, I got the call literally while I was at THQ on the job and it was like middle of the day as you were jumping into the 17th hole and it was just a nightmare world that I was in 17th time you kill yourself and so I got the call I went outside found out I won the contest I came back into THQ got all my stuff didn't say a word and just walked (laughs) right out the door and drove home it's like a movie (laughs) yeah it was seriously like a movie I didn't call them I didn't tell them I didn't put in my two weeks or anything I was just like I knew this was it I wonder how many days they thought you were like a ghost. <laughs> you actually went down the hole. Yeah, someone went. <laughs> <laughs> that video game really has an error. That, yeah, where was my we QA tester? We lost into the game. <laughs> Somebody make that note. Uh, <laughs> so I left and then I got home and I told Sarah, I was like, I won this contest. This is it. And she's like, yeah, but what about your job? Ah, forget it. Don't even worry about it. And she was like so pissed off at me. She was like, you need stability. And she was, I mean, God bless her. She like tried to keep me as on the level as possible. Well, it's a reasonable question because Comic-Con <laughs> only total, lasts it's over, right. over a weekend. And <laughs> what was I thinking? Honestly, at the t- like thinking about it now, what was I thinking? How could this contest be my big break? But somehow I felt in the pit of my stomach that this was it. Like I I knew I had like the 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 um the charisma. I knew I could do it. I knew I could somehow weasel my way into something. Like yeah. just using my attitude and my energy and my positivity and just throwing it all out there in the world and just giving it everything. Mm -hmm. So I went and did this and I convinced Sarah that everything was going to be okay. And like I said, I mean, we had just gotten married, (laughs) just moved into an apartment in Oak Park. I mean, Sarah was like thinking about real life logical stuff. And I was thinking of like dream in the clouds. This is like a big chance I'm taking type stuff. So we did it. And you cut the safety net. I totally cut the safety net. Which from an entertainment standpoint, like, I mean, we fast forward, we kind of know where you've landed. And so it, I, you know, I'm very interested in connecting the dots and Mm -hmm. I want to, Mm -hmm. but I will say that it, there's a, I've heard many people who make it entertainment say at some point you just have to go for it. And if they're, and I've heard a lot of people say you, what, you can't have a plan B. You know, even though it, it makes total sense, the interesting thing was you cut your safety net for two people. And that's, you know, that's, it has to be scary. Oh, it's insane. <clears throat> but I mean, imagine having a family. Or imagine having like so many other people counting on you to bring in a steady amount of income. I know the feeling. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> like where, I mean, how could you? How could you make such a big like weird chance? Or how could you take a big chance like that? It was easier for us because, I mean, we, we inched into it much more slowly. And the move to LA, move across the country was in answer to um, the opportunity to have our own television show. So it wasn't like... It wasn't as big of a risk for us, I will say. Right. But then what happened after you went to Comic-Con? You killed it. So I killed it, and and my wife was, at the time, was like talking me up. And so the next thing I know, I get a call, and they're like, we want you to come to the Sony Picture Studio lot, and we'll, do, we'll take you around on the back lot tour so you can check out everything. And then we'll have you come into our digital division where you, where they like worked with you at Comic Con, and we'll have you uh, interview and maybe get a job. And and you're like, like, see, right? I told you, I know. And I was like, well, this is it. This is what I was thinking would happen, and it just so happened it happened. <laughs> and so I go there and I take the tour, and Sarah's with me. And then the next thing I know, I'm in someone's office. They're interviewing me, and then they're like, "Can you start Monday?" <laughs> and I'm like, what? "Yes, I can." <laughs> Why, yes, I can. <laughs> so that that like free fall. Going from one trapeze, you cut the net. I'm gonna yeah. keep the analogy going. Keep it going. I like and you're it. You're like, you let go of one. Yeah. It wasn't long before you caught the next one. So it wasn't you long know. at all. Like I, I, I quit my job a week ago, and then there I am getting a new job at Sony Pictures at their digital division. And but they threw me. They they hired me on as talent for their like to throw at events and stuff to be like a blogger type person. But then the next thing I know, I'm working in their video production world. And then five years later. I'm like a sound design guy doing the sounds. If you go to the original Paul Blart Mall Cop website, 
every sound you hear was me. I did all mostly, those sounds. Mostly farts. So. All fart sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's all, and it's just all me. Yeah. I, that, that first fart sound you made literally scared me. It was good. Oh, 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 oh really? Like, I did, well, you should have hired me back then. It was, was good. I, I, Where were you when I needed a real good fart? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so that website's still up that now. Website, I'm sure a, it is. There's a how? sequel. Because there's a sequel. Okay. Yeah. How did that happen? I don't know, man, because I didn't go, I dropped out of high school, didn't go to college, had zero, like, I have no resume. At this point, it's like I worked at a video game store and that's that. And so for some reason, I just kind of weaseled my way into this. But did you feel five year job? Did you feel like I mean, where I thought you might be going with that was I started doing this, but then I ended up making sounds on a website and that wasn't me. That wasn't what I wanted. Oh, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't. It was just this kind of like natural organic progression in this corporate world of me trying everything I could to stay relevant and not be fired because the guy sitting next to me went to USC film school and graduated like Mm -hmm. with like crazy honors in his class. And the guy on my right went to Brown and graduated in marketing. And there's all these like crazy people with like accolades and awards and grad and like crazy framed graduation diploma things. And, and, Mm -hmm. and here I am the, like the loser guy that somehow just weaseled his way in. And, and I honestly feel like at this point they kept me around basically just for morale because I'd walk around making people laugh and kept the positivity up and like, right was like just that guy that they were like, oh man, you just make us laugh and it's so funny. And I was entertaining all these people and it was nice, but it wasn't, fulfilling me in any way creatively it was so what what was the next turn out of desk work so i'm i'm at this point where i start joining like la casting and i and i try to get an agent and i'm trying to do you know extra work and like i was i did like i was in a buck cherry music video I, I was in a Buck Cherry music video. We we've met Buck Cherry on the, gre- the red carpet. At the you Grammys, interviewed yeah. them at the <laughs> Grammys. <laughs> yeah, while well, I filmed you. There it is. That's the six degrees of yeah. Kevin Bacon with Rhett Link and Steve. <laughs> well, Zardoza. were you like a were you like a, a lead in this thing? Yeah, like, I was. I was. It was the, the funny guy in the video. I was the funny guy in the video, and it was the video is called "Too Drunk to." <laughs> and it's one, and that's what it's called. And so, if you want to look it up, you can. Sometimes I'm the you that are, video. and sometimes you are. I actually yeah. already have it up here. Oh no! <laughs> <I don't. laughs> anyway, so I did that, and then I did stuff. I did like a thousand ways to die, an episode of a thousand ways to die, and then I did like some little things here and there, but it still wasn't enough. And then one day, I sent in and a, uh, a tape to James Hafner, who works at with Phil DeFranco at DeFranco uh, yeah. Inc. or whatever. And then they were like, the next thing I know, they're casting like, call for what became Swords Fit. It was a casting call for. In fact, this is this is a weird bit of trivia. It was a casting call for what would end up being Curb Cash, which oh, was yeah. the show that Kevin Bruick ended yep. up doing, which was killed almost immediately. But um, they wanted a man on the street, like a funny man on the street type guy. And so I came in and did an audition. And then the next thing I know, I'm at an audition space and like Lee Newton's there and Joe Beretta's there and Elliot Morgan's there. And then all these other people that like I would meet later on that ended up being also YouTube people. And then they're doing like chemistry tests. And then they're like, we want you. We want you to come work at SourceFed. We want you to be the fourth person. We Hmm. want it to be Joe, Elliot, Lee, Steve. And this was like just before SourceFed started. Hmm. So it was like, uh, I would love to do that, but I'm working at a job where I have like a 401k and I have like benefits and vacation time and like a decent salary. And then this is like a YouTube thing that is just starting. Yeah. And I didn't know yeah. anything there about was, there, YouTube. You didn't have a point of reference for Philip Zero. DeFranco. Zero. I didn't even know who he was. Yeah. I'd yeah. never heard his name before. Right. And so- I didn't know. All I knew is is that this would this would be an entertainer job that I could get hired for, where I would be making funny videos every day. So you turned it down. Well, I I I did initially. I was like, I can do part time, and so they were like, okay, let's do part time. So I would like I was able to maintain that for a while. I would hmm. come in and do a little bit, and that those were my first appearances on SourceFed as like a part time guy. It's interesting that without that point of reference, you know you. you the, you said, "Well, I got a four hundred one k." It's like even in your mind, over those five years, like yeah. the corporate the corporate mentality had kind of like seized oh, it you a little bit. Swallowed me up, and, and it was and as a guy, that moxie who, was kind of gone a little. Gone. Bit. The the wackiness was like subside. Like someone put a big chastity belt on my humor mm-hmm. genitals. 
<laughs> like so, seriously. So what? So what did lead to cutting the cord? Like a I lot need... of negative YouTube comments. I got to get more. Of. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for people to say racist things about me. I've never right. heard. No, I think it got to a point where I was like, I am unhappy at this corporate, gross, not creative desk job. Even though it's super comfortable, the money's nice. I'm able to live comfortably. You know, I'm, I keep my wife happy. Everything's great. Life's great, but I'm not happy. And I wasn't. What I really wanted to do was to entertain people. And so I just took a massive chance and a massive pay cut and was just like, all right. And, and I had so many nights with Sarah. Will, can this work? Can we, can we do this? Can, can it like, can we survive financially financially? And she was like, this is about as low as we can do. And so I kept going back and forth with the guys at SourceFed. I was like, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And then eventually they were like, all right, let's do it. And so I quit my job at Sony and I started working at SourceFed and the most intense anxiety I had ever felt in my life attacked my soul and mind and, and everything I had gone into like from the wacky fun guy to like agoraphobic. I don't, I can't leave my house type stuff. And this is when you were already hosting. Yes. This was like maybe a month or two into barely starting as a full-time host at SourceFed. And how did that manifest itself in the way you were, you were interacting with, you know, Joe and Lee and Elliot. Well, for them, they were very, they were very much confused because they were like, "Here's this like super happy go lucky, fun, positive guy who, as soon as he's done shooting a video, if he could even get through a full video without having like some sort of weird panic attack or something, suddenly is not like hanging out with us after work, and suddenly is not even talking to." Him. And like, and I would go like, I remember the first VidCon I ever went to. I guess that was 2012. June of 2012, I think. This was like maybe like a month into the starting SourceFed. Joe was like, dude, I know you're not going to want to go to parties and I know you're not going to want to talk to people and stuff, but like you are so new in the YouTube world. Like you got to talk to people and you got to seem like a friendly person. Otherwise, you're going to look like a dick to everybody. Mm -hmm. Like here's this guy that just started on SourceFed and now, and he he won't even talk to us and stuff like that. But little did they know. And I tried telling them, I'm like, dude, I'm just... Something happened. I think it was a combination of I got into this really crazy car wreck in oh. Culver City. And I think it was a combination of that and cutting the cord and your analogy of like the safety net's gone from Sony, Sony to YouTube. And suddenly I'm like, oh, my God, now there's like thousands of people that are watching me every day. What was the, what was the car wreck and how did that? So the car wreck was like. You? I was driving home from work at Sony one day and it just, someone smashed into me going like 80 miles per hour, destroyed my little VW bug, which I loved so much. I was fine. I didn't like need to go to the hospital or anything. Had a lot of back problems and all that kind of stuff. But I think it just gave me this intense like PTSD. Like after that, I couldn't really drive and I had already suffered ang through anxiety my entire life. But I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. I didn't yeah, know what when these you, feelings you, you were. You talk about it was like a resurgence of that weird hermit crab zone that you yes. described. Yes. From, you know, back of the end of your high school exactly. time. And I went from a guy that would like get up on stage and pull my pants down and start singing and just to being a guy that couldn't even leave the house because of this like crazy traumatic experience. But you would leave to shoot on SourceFed. I would. But you couldn't make it through. There, there sometimes were... I couldn't at all. Sometimes I would be Sometimes I would be driving to work and I'd be like, okay, my heart's racing. I can't, uh, uh, and I'd call James and be like, dude, I've been puking all night. I can't come into work. And then I would go home and I would lock myself in my room. I would go under the covers and I'd be like, I think I'm dying. I don't know what's happening to my body, my brain. Where's the guy that used to be able to like, do anything. How did, and like, did you get help? I mean, yeah, I ended up going to therapy and therapy didn't work at all. It was like, you got to get in this mind space and you got to take breathing and like take a moment to go outside onto the grass and like do a little yoga. And like it was, it just was not working. Like nothing was working. And then I, I honestly can't tell you 100% with 100% certain certainty what got me out of it. Hmm. But I think with a little bit of guidance from Joe, because Joe, Beretta is like the greatest mentor anyone could ever have. The dude is just wise beyond his years. He was so supportive. Once he, once I finally like opened up to him and was like, okay, this is what's going on with me. I can't keep it from everybody. This is what it is. I guess it's anxiety attacks. You know, I, I just need to be open with you guys and tell you what this is. 
And Joe was just like super supportive, was like, dude, don't worry, I'll help you as much as I can. And I think it just ended up becoming like this comfort that came from my peers and then from Sarah and then from just like slowly getting into the success of SourceFed and then learning that this wasn't going to be just this one-time thing that was going to fall apart. I think the stability of it really brought my right. mental state back up. So it wasn't one thing or there wasn't one key. It was the support of people around you and then and kind of a just slow snapping climb. out of it. Was it a snap out? I don't know. I mean, I can't I can't or really, a slow climb out of it. I guess I, mean, I guess it was a slow climb because it wasn't I can't remember like one day being so bad and then the next day being like, "Hey, that was weird." It really was like months later because then I could confide in people like Meg, Meg Turney, who at the time who then started on the channel like a couple of months after me as well, who was like, "I suffer from anxiety too." And then I was talking to other people who were like, oh, yeah, I have panic attacks. I can't even leave the house sometimes. And it was kind of like seeking kind of like solace from people that were also going through the same things that really kind of like helped me break out of it a little bit. And it was. I guess it was transitional. And did this manifest itself in the, your work? Did you? I think so. Did, can you go back and look at those videos and you're like, I was totally oh, yeah, freaking yeah. out yeah. on in that fact, episode. Sarah could even see it too. She used to watch videos and be like, you look like you're sick. You look hmm. like you're like going to puke or something. And I was like, yeah, that's me having a straight up panic attack. Like that's a panic attack. On screen. On screen, on video. Yeah, you can go back to my early videos and definitely see that, I think. And so slowly or suddenly, you can't really figure out, you kind of came out of that. Yeah. And you've kind of become the the linchpin in, in a lot of ways of, of SourceFed as everyone that you mentioned that was there originally is no longer there. Yeah, no longer there. You've got tenure. I mean, you're, if, there, if that exists, <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah, the you're, only, right. you're the only one who could have that title at this point. Yeah, it's true. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the survivor. But it, I mean, it, I'm operating on the assumption that you're not going to be there forever and that you're going to be the next one to depart from SourceFed. Even the tweet from the SourceFed account <laughs> on April Fool's Day was that you were leaving. <laughs> right, so, right. Uh, right. So what, what's, the, what's the plan? What's the approach Well, here? I think for me, it's one of those things where, I mean, I've been doing it for like three and a half years now. I think we could, that's three and a half years, right? 2012? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 2012, It's almost, it's almost three and a half years yeah. now. So it's like, <clears throat> yeah. I, and I think Phil, even from the very beginning, was like, when we had our like kind of our our uh, interview meeting, when we kind of had lunch and just before I started full time at SourceFed, Phil had said to me, you know, if, if you guys are still here in like five years, if you know, then that I'm not doing my job right. And I don't think the company's like doing well because it's like this is definitely kind of like a launching pad for a lot of people, I feel like. And for me, I'm one of those guys that's like now I'm a YouTuber, but I feel like it's almost like. It almost hurt. It, it doesn't feel good to say like I'm a YouTuber because there are people who like worked their asses off from like getting zero views on their videos to like to getting very lucky and suddenly getting growing this massive fan base. I kind of just jumped into a world that already had this pre-existing fan base in Phil's world and kind of, you know, three years later built up a lot of stuff in SourceFed and definitely was a big major part of the success of SourceFed and SourceFed Nerd. But I feel kind of like ashamed to be like, yes, I and I should be here along the likes of Joe Beretta and Luke Baratz and Rhett Link and Olga Kay and people like that who have put in like the work. You know, so I feel kind of that kind of stuff too. But well, I can, I, and I'll say the but. I think that having – yeah, I can see that you know you might feel that way. You you were a hired gun that then yes, but you sh you helped shape something that helped change the landscape of what YouTube is, arguably. That's true. And won a lot of awards in the process, you know. So it's uh, that goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, I we, now, we all get here in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I think I I can say plus now you don't I've you don't it, have as many uh, embarrassing videos <laughs> no, where you no. were emulating someone else before you figured out what it is you were supposed to be <laughs> you doing. You don't have the videos that you needed to delete. You're right. I don't yeah. have any videos. Even on the private. ones where you were having a panic attack in the middle of them. <laughs> right. You I don't have to, have to delete. I have those. to sit with those. But no, I I so yeah. Even Phil was like, if you're still working there, I, it's kind of bad. But so for me, it's like so you're resigning. I'm resigning. I'm fine. I'm quitting right now. No, I I uh, I don't see it. I don't see myself leaving. You're just gonna walk. But when you do. We know how you're going to do it. And I, you're going to you're going to gather your stuff and you're just going to walk out and not call anyone. What's and just, the plan? 
<laughs> what is the plan? I mean, now that it's kind of like a, it, I've made I've made full circle from the corporate world of Sony into the corporate world of Discovery. It's kind of like the formalities need to stay kind of like on the level there. So I don't think I could just run and go. I can't Irish goodbye the the source fed job. <laughs> right. But at this point, especially if I don't want to burn any bridges or anything like that. But I mean, I, I mean, everyone's kind of looking for the next thing, right? Especially if you're doing something long enough, you're like, what's next? You're always thinking like, what's next? Well, and I assume that you, you know, you have a desire to, to get out there and do your own thing. Too. Yeah. And not, and not even just like my own thing. Like I kind of want to do, you know, like maybe in the, in the future, like TV and movies and yeah, stuff like right. that. You do know? you have a timeline? I don't, I should, but I don't. I'm going to be 33 in like a couple of weeks. I'm an old man. And in YouTube years, that's like crazy, right? Oh, we're like grandfathers when My it comes eyes to are right? rolling. I know. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got your Zay Franks and, and your... You can say us. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. like, we're not as old as Zay Frank, but no, hey, no, we're, no. we're close. <laughs> but so you've experienced this transition. Um, you know, it sounds like some of those things have been dealt with, but, you know, you've also been relatively open about what you've gone through. Yes. Uh with your ex-wife, yes, y- you had a vlog in January yes. that's still up, where you referenced another vlog that is no longer <laughs> it's up. no longer up. Where yeah. you said I had a video that explained a little bit about my personal life, uh. but I took it down once I th- explain what your your mentality. Is. So I, I um, yeah, because like man, in this YouTube world, it's very much like nothing is personal. Nothing can be kept secret in your in your personal life or in your professional life. And so when things start going south for Sarah and I. And, like, when it started to become, like, you know, she's moving out of the house and, like, we're actually splitting up, it it occurred to me that, like, man, I do Vines and Snapchats and things like this where Sarah is, like, in all of this stuff. And Sarah was even doing, like, little episodes of my my shows on my personal channel with me. Like, we would review, like, The Leftovers or, like, Game of Thrones or something like that. So she's very much a part. And, you know, she would be in my, like, live streams. You could hear her talking about things while she was, like, knitting little characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so when it got to the point where like things gone had gone south in our relationship and we weren't living together anymore, I was like, okay, fans are going to start to like wonder where the hell Sarah is. And they already were. And then they're going to f- try to find things out and then spread rumors. And then the next thing I know, it's going to be like all this misinformation. And here I am dealing with the ridiculousness of like splitting up from someone and then the potential for divorce and all this insanity in my own personal life on top of like, how am I going to explain this to the viewers and how am I going to explain that I'm being like a total jerk or kind of like you can see it on my face in table talks that I'm like visually visibly unhappy. Something's going on. Like what's wrong with Steve? He seems angry or weird. And obviously I've got all this terrible stuff happening in my personal life. So there has to be some sort of explanation. And to me, there had to be some sort of like setting the record straight type thing. But what what do you, I mean, with so much change from, you know, you met her at a really difficult time. Yes. She helped pull you out of that. Yes. You continue to go through a difficult time. You changed a lot personally. Was this a, well, we fell in love in high school and now we're different people? Like, what is your... I think it was very much that. It was one of those things where it was like, so we we got married in 2006. We had known each other at this point for like 12 years. And then, you know, something like that, 12 years, 11 years. And then married for like eight years. And so it was like we got to a point where we were changing so much as as individuals. And because of my intense busyness in the YouTube world and because of like I started doing other work and I started traveling abroad, I would go to like start traveling to different conventions and I would be home less and less. And it started to become one of those things where it was like my personal life was almost non-existent with Sarah, which was unfair to her. So it just got to a point where it was like, I'm not being fair to her because she wants something out of life and she's not being fair to me because I want something else out of life. So it was this very mutual kind of like, this is what we need to do. Right. And for me, it's like, I'm, am I going to not take these opportunities that could lead to something bigger and better for us just because like, you know, we need to be more personally together and mm-hmm. Do that kind of thing. And so was, we were both being unfair to each other for what we wanted in life. So we just decided, let's just call it off. Let's just do this. Let's just move on. Yeah, how you difficult know? was that? The hard, I mean, I'd say the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life, for sure. Hmm. I mean, it was very, very difficult. I mean, obviously, I very much was in love with Sarah, and we were very much in love with each other. So it was one of those things that was like, we were so young when we 
decided to get married mm-hmm. that it was like it was almost like in a weird way it was like destined for failure it was destined to be some sort of like we would split ways and grow apart and change so it was it was very very difficult but i mean and it, and even more difficult to be like is this what i want in a life am i making the right decision by ending a marriage by mutually ending a marriage because like this is what i want out of life but i mean it's not, it wasn't just that obviously there were many other little issues here and there like little relationship issues mm mm-hmm. But it ultimately came down to this is this is something I've always wanted to do with my life and I need to pursue it and I can't not go that way, you know? Right. Do so, you guys still talk? We do. We do. We didn't. There was some very difficult times in the beginning and some animosity and some anger. and But now – we're super cool. Now it's like I'm happier than I'm ever than I've ever been in my life, and so am I. And we're both saying these things to each other, like this is the best decision we both could have made. And I think it's like the fact that she's happy and like feels amazing and feels better than she ever has is like perfect for me. It's I love that. I want her to be happy. I want her to move on. I want her to to get everything she wants. So like now that she's kind of like on this road to doing that, I feel so happy for her. I feel absolutely happy for her. Are you happy or are you just starting to be able to get happier? Like wh- where are you in that process? Oh, I'm happy. I'm I'm happy. Because I because it's I'm no longer wasting someone's time that I care a lot about and and in the process I am fulfilling the my personal needs as well. So I'm like in a really good place right now. And in your your vlog you said 2015 was a year of change. Huge and year you're, you're of change. Now, you know, almost six months into that year. Yeah. So what's changing? I mean, I'm definitely not um like the like married guy. I'm definitely now this like just this kind of disconnected from that kind of weird lifestyle guy. So now I'm just kind of like this free man that is just kind of like – not super concerned with with this other person that I could potentially be offending or not spending enough time with or something like that. Not to say that like, oh, relationships suck or marriage sucks or whatever, but it's like those responsibilities not being such a massive weight on me and the and those and the ideas of the arguments and just kind of like the endless frustration is being gone makes me a completely different person. It makes me happier. It makes me I feel like I concentrate more on my work. I feel like I'm I'm more focused on where my career is heading. It's I don't know. I feel like it's it's the best thing I could have done for myself, for my career, and for my emotions. And how do you think that change is going <clears> to <throat> manifest itself in your career? I mean, you, we talked about okay, well, a source fed isn't going to last forever. Right. Is, is that does that change that you're experiencing personally lead to this? a desire for a professional change. Yeah. I mean, I think it does. And I think it, I think the fact that like I'm putting out an album this year and actually doing it is a big deal because before it would be something I would just talk about and be like, Oh, I want to do that and I'm going to do it. And then I wouldn't because it would be like, well, you know, I've got this other life I'm dealing with and you know, I've got, you know, my wife and I, this, and and I've got all this other stuff going on and oh, I mean, these vlogs. And I mean, now it's like, not to say that I have more time, but I just, feel more focused on things that I definitely want to and need to do with my life. And I feel like that's where 2015 is. And that's writing songs about whales. About whales. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and about animals. Yeah, exactly. And the, what is the little, the, the cute little thing? What is The it? axolotl. Axolotl, which I will look up immediately. You got, if you over. can even spell it, I dare you. Oh, well, we'll I, I'm going to be uh, wikipedia in this thing right after this. Yeah, Wikipedia the hell out of it. I'm going to work wiki this. <laughs> That's even a word. Well, listen, man, thanks for uh, being so candid with us and yeah. sharing your story. It's cool to get to know you. Yeah. And there you have it, our Ear Biscuit with Steve Zaragoza. Tweet at Steve. His handle is Steve Zaragoza, G-O-Z-A. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. Let him know what you thought uh, of the conversation. And um, that's always good. So we, we really do appreciate that and reviewing uh, this show on iTunes. And I have taken uh, it upon myself to look up the axolotl 
You Googled it? I you, did. He, he said you wouldn't know how to spell it. Uh, well, I misspelled it at first and then they asked me. See who's right. Did you mean this? I mean, how would you ever know to say this? A-X-O-L-O-T-L. Axolotl. Yeah, axolotl. Oh, uh, I thought it was A-X-E-L-O-T-I. Axolotl, not axolotl. Axolotl, okay. Yeah, that would be an axolotl that it's a member Is of the this Illuminati. Worthy? Yeah, okay, yeah. Is this worthy of a Steve? Song? I mean, based on your oh, your Googling? I mean, this thing is ridiculously interesting. It's extinct? Interesting. Well, it's crazy. So it's also known as the Mexican salamander or the Mexican walking fish. Uh, the picture on uh, Wikipedia is not that, this picture right here, one that's in captivity, is really, really interesting. It's an underwater creature? It's a salamander. And Salamanders aren't necessarily underwater, they're amphibians, uh, aren't they? It's, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I guess amphibious. I mean, they need water to survive. They have to be close to water. But anyway. It looks like a deep sea creature. The, the, the Yeah, but it's not. As of 2010, wild axolotls were near extinction due to urbanization in Mexico City and consequent water pollution. So they're like, like living in the interior of the country because, you know, Mexico City is like landbound landlocked or whatever. So this isn't this is a freshwater salamander, but a four month long search in twenty thirteen turned up no surviving individuals in the wild. So people are like going out and trying to find these things. So there's still some in captivity, but they can't find any in the wild, at least in, in terms of uh it's since twenty thirteen. So I guess it's just gone extinct, man. It's kinda sad. I guess so it is gonna be a lullaby as this thing slowly Fades into uh, maybe, non-existence. Maybe his song will, will you know, have an insurgence and bring him back. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think a song is going to bring this thing back, Link. Well, if the song makes them want to procreate, then maybe it will. Mm, if well, it's not a, lu- a lullaby, but more of a slow jam. Okay, a slow jam for axolotls. We need to tell Steve that. And then, slow jam that axolotl. And then we're going to bring him back and let him loose in Mexico City. All right. Okay, sounds like a plan. Maybe maybe we should do that. We could be a part of that. We should start a foundation. I don't know if we're committed to that plan or the foundation, but we are committed to delivering another ear biscuit. The into association your ears holes. The association next week. for the establishment of a new axolotl population via slow jams. That's the name of it. You can figure out what that spells. And try to pronounce it on your own time. Yeah. Here at you next week. <laughs>